Sure. Thanks a lot again. Um, first of all, thanks to you guys for coming out. I mean, it means a lot to us when uh, we have the opportunity to, to sell our program. And, and like I say in recruiting, I feel like we've got the best area in the country, uh, especially when it comes to media, where we've got two major metropolitan areas that cover us. And so to have you guys here live and in person and not the Zooms that we've uh, become accustomed to, uh, it's great to, to be doing this in person. And I want to personally thank you guys for the job you've done um, over the last year, of making the adjustments and still finding a way uh, to, to get our players and their stories and, and Maryland football out to the public. Uh, we've had an exciting summer here uh, with our team. A lot of moving parts started June 1, you know, with recruiting opening up uh, to moving into Jones Hill House, uh, with our players returning uh, to move into Jones Hill House, our summer workouts. Uh, all those things really took place uh, during the month of June. And, and I can tell you, a lot of people played a major role in helping us navigate a really busy summer. But through it all, the thing that really shined through for me was the fact that seeing our players and how they've continued to build the culture that we've talked about, it's going to take for us to have the type of program we want to have. But also, obviously, during COVID, there was a lot of isolation involved uh, with being, a part, being in a pandemic. They're really excited to be back together and start building the brotherhood that's necessary. Um, and I saw it all summer long with our players. Um, as I mentioned in Big Ten Media Day, our program's ready to take the next step. Uh, everybody always says, well, what's the goal? Well, the goal for us is to take the next step, and that begins and ends with playing and having the type of discipline while still establishing the types of habits that will create the behaviors we need to, to win and win big here. Um, I said it before, uh, there's not a, any excuses for us this year. Uh, you know, COVID is what it is. We'll continue to follow the protocols that state, local, and campus officials ask us to follow as we navigate it. But as far as the football piece and the discipline piece and developing our program, you know, it's time for the excuses to end. And, and we're not going to allow our players or anybody that's part of our football family to make any excuse. I mean, we talk a lot about potential around here. I've had the luxury of being here for, I think this is my 14th season. Uh, and, and you always hear the potential word. Uh, I've been here when we won three straight years of 10 or more wins and won the ACC championship back in those days. I've also been here for some of the lean years. So the potential word for me is something that we're, we're over uh, as a program and, and looking forward to really going out and establishing ourselves as a program that has the ability to do great things. Um, like I said, uh, I'm really pleased with the talent level. Um, when you look at our team and, and what we've been able to do in the three short years of being here, we feel like we've brought in the, the smart, tough, and reliable players that usually give yourself a chance to win. And we've balanced the roster. Uh, we've gotten our numbers kind of fixed in all the different areas that ensures that our roster is made up with the right kind of guys, but also we have the, the correct numbers to continue to build upon. 86% um, of our uh, production on offense returns, uh, 10 of 11 starters return on defense. And I know for some of you guys, you say, well, we, we weren't very good on defense or offense last year, but we played a lot of young players. I think last year we had 56 first-time Terps. And the more games, the more opportunities, the more experiences that we get, we, we get from playing games, the better you'll see and you'll con continue to see the development of the talent while in our programs. Our, player reported, our players reported for camp yesterday. Uh, we're, we're headquartering over at the hotel uh, to create kind of that, that bubble necessary for us as a team. It's the one time in our lives every year that we get to just focus totally on football. There's no school. There's no 20-hour uh, rule. It's 24 hours of football, rest, recovery, rehydration, and doing all the necessary things that we've got to do to build the callus that's going to be necessary for us to get through a tough season uh, playing in the Big Ten Conference. Um, the competition that you'll see out on the field is what's going to make us grow um, at every position, and that's what recruiting does for you. It allows you to build your roster to where each and every position group has tremendous competition, which I think as, as in any business, when you have competition, it pushes you to be your best each and every opportunity you get. And we feel really strongly that we've been able to bring in the type of talent that creates competition across the board at every position as we take the field. Um, today, like I said before, is a lot like Christmas for me. 
It's the first day I get to kind of see the team that we've established or the team that we've put together for the 21 season. And whether you win or lose, last year means nothing. Everything's about the 21 season moving forward. And we're going to continue to, to do the things necessary to build Maryland football program uh, to where we all want it to be. So uh, with that, you know, I'll open it up to any questions that you guys may have. How's it going, Coach? What's going on, man? Um, let's first, I guess, start off um, the quarterbacks. Can you, you know, give the latest um, with Udinsky and uh, Nigerian and kind of what your expectations are for the position here in camp? Yeah, you know, we're very fortunate because at the end of last season, we had one scholarship pro, uh, quarterback in our program. And I know we made it a priority to, to try to build the depth in that room while also trying to bring in guys that will give us an opportunity that if, yeah, to create competition for the position. You know, obviously, uh, we have a returning starter in Leah. Uh, we've been able to add a guy like Reese Udinsky who – you know, when we started the recruiting process on him once he went in the portal, you know, here's a guy that had an NFL grade on him. I mean, I think he was a fifth through seventh round grade, had opportunities if he would have chosen to, to turn pro. You know, unfortunately had the ACL, but here's the great thing. Uh, he's been cleared to go. Uh, he's 100% cleared to start practice today. Obviously no contact, which we don't ta tackle our quarterbacks anyway. Uh, Eric Nigerian had off-season shoulder surgery, uh, and I can tell you the last couple of weeks he's increased uh, his throwing. He's back. Now we'll, we'll have him kind of on a pitch count because of the throwing shoulder and the surgery that we'll kind of monitor how many reps he takes throwing the football. But being able to have Eric back and healthy this early, uh, we've really helped ourselves with the way those two have progressed. And then, you know, there's a guy, David Fouts, that, uh, Fouts, that I'm – really, really been impressed with as a walk-on quarterback that, you know, that that's going to compete and give us a chance. So we feel like going into it, you know, with those four guys, uh, as well as the two walk-on quarterbacks we brought in, that we've been able to create some depth at the quarterback position, and we feel really good about the direction of, of where we are with that position. Uh, hey, Coach. I just want to ask, when you took over the job uh, a few years ago, what type of culture did you want to establish within the program, and how has that formulated and since you've been here, yeah, I think what I what I envision from a, a culture standpoint is a player driven culture. Um, you know what I've learned over the years, you know, thirty years in this business, is that when the team is led by coaches, they're typically a, a good team. When we as coaches have to lead and we have to police and we have to push, uh, you usually can get some good play out of your team. But when it's player driven. I mean, when that policing comes from within the ranks, uh, when that guy next to you looks at you when you're complaining or, or making excuses and, and he says, look, man, that's not what we're about, and it's coming from within, that's where you know you have a chance to be great. And what I've seen uh, is some of those things happen here in the last six, seven months. It started in spring ball. It's continued on through the summer to where uh, we're a player-driven team, and that's where it needs to be if you want to have success, because ultimately when they step in between the white lines, as coaches, we can prepare them. But once they go inside the white lines, they've got to go execute and they've got to rely on each other. And I've really seen our team take on that type of personality. Um, I also think we, we're a team uh, from a culture standpoint that don't we don't we don't believe and we're not going to make excuses. We're not going to complain about things. Uh, we got a job to do. And the bottom line is to figure out how to get your job accomplished. I see that out of this team. And that's to me is what's been very encouraging. Coach, uh, back tracking to the quarterbacks, Talia, uh, what has impressed you the most with his growth in the last year since he's been on campus, and where do you expect him to make strides between now and Labor Day weekend? Yeah, I, th I think the biggest thing with Leah is his command of the offense. Um, you know, obviously he had – some familiarity with it because he got, you know, installed at the place he was before because they continue to do some of the things that we do as well. And so really now, because he didn't play a lot his first year, uh, to be able to play in four games last year and add to, as I call it, his toolbox, um, you know, now when, he, we're, when we're talking and we have plays that we're executing, he knows the why. 
He understands where the ball needs to go. He understands where the start of it is and where the end of the progression is. And to me, those are all the fine intricacies. But I also have seen him take a step forward from a leadership standpoint. Um, you know, Lee is a guy that's very confident in his ability and very confident in terms of getting his job done. But now I see him starting to take steps where the encouragement of the other position groups. You know, we had a, a, a short uh, administrative meeting yesterday with the offense. And, and as we sat there and, and finished doing some of the administrative things, he asked the coaches if we could, you know, leave so that he could say something to the, to the offense. And to me, you know, not that it was a player only meeting, but the fact that he is taking kind of the bull by the horn in terms of stepping out in front. Um, last year, he was getting to know his teammates. They were new. The pandemic didn't cr allow him to create the relationships necessary. But now I see him really stepping forward from a leadership standpoint. Hey, Mike, Gene Wong with The Washington Post. Um, since you've been through one season of the pandemic and um, now that the Delta variant is kind of creating surges across the country, can you able, are you able to share with us the vaccination status of, of the team and kind of how much you have to remind the players to still be vigilant? Because um, it looks like we're not out of the woods yet completely. Yeah, great question. Um, there's no doubt about um, we're well aware, obviously, as a program, as being one of those teams last year that really struggled uh, to, to, to play the amount of games we wanted to play. And so that definitely uh, plays a major role in how we approach things. I'm very confident in our, med in our medical staff and as well as, you know, our state, local, and, and, and on-campus leaders that they're going to continue to give us the protocols necessary to navigate it. Um, you know, when it comes to our vaccination, obviously, you know, to be here on campus, you have to be vaccinated or at least have some form of a waiver. And I think, as I've said before, we're somewhere around 93% uh, in terms of our team. Uh, being vaccinated and our staff, uh, I think we're, I know we're hundred percent with our staff being vaccinated. So now what we've got to do is just continue to follow the guidelines. And if they, if we come out with a mask mandate inside the building, that's what we'll do. If we have to social distance, we're fortunate now that we moved into Jones Hill house, which has given us a lot more room to be able, if we need to make adjustments, we will. And, and our team understands we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, with the Delta variant and, and what it's doing locally here. But um, again, there's no excuses for us. If it, we do what we need to do to go out and get the job done and we're willing to do whatever it takes to go play. Hi coach, uh, Jacob Richmond from the Diamondback. It's great to see you. Good to see you, Jacob. Thank you. Um, I'd love to ask, you know, how, what are you expecting from the team today specifically to get started on the right foot? Yeah, I mean, as with any first practice, the big thing you want to do is see guys uh, be organized. Uh, you know, we, we've had a lot of time to prepare for this first practice. You know, in my staff meeting this morning, you know, I'm dotting I's and crossing T's with our staff to make sure, you know, we're in a new facility, we're on a new practice field. Everything is still kind of new for us. And so, you know, just being organized, number one. Uh, number two, you know, I'm looking to see our guys go out and practice with the right kind of energy. And then, you know, I can't say it enough. You'll hear this word uh, quite a bit throughout our program this year, uh, the discipline that it takes to, in, in creating the right habits, which form the right behaviors. And, uh, you know, again, I'm excited to be able to see who we are, um, what type of team we're going to become. And, and that's what training camp's for, is to get those questions answered. And what a great way to, to measure it by having to play a team like West Virginia the first game of the year. So we're excited about that. We've got a lot of work to do up, up to get us to September 4th. And, and it seems like our team's excited to do the work. Wayne Viner, Turp Talk. Can you talk about the depth in the receiver group? What's up, Wayne Viner, Turk Talk? You good? Yeah, the receiver group for me is, uh, as I've said before, one of the, the deepest uh, rooms that I've been a part of uh, and top to bottom, really talented. Um, we've got some veteran guys like Dante Demas and Jay Sean uh, that have played a lot of football around here. Uh, you've got some good young players like the, you know, Rakim Jarrett's and, you know, Daywan McDougal's and, and Brian Cobb's another veteran. So from top to bottom, I think it's probably the, the deepest, most talented position on our team. And, and we need those guys to go out and play to their ability because we're going to lean on our playmakers. As we go into training camp, we always try to identify 
who are the playmakers in our offense, on our defense, and in our special teams, and find ways to keep them involved in all three phases. So excited about the group, but you know, now they got to live up to the expectation we have. Bruce Posner, also from Turf Talk. Uh, Coach, first of all, congratulations on the vaccination uh, percentage and having the staff. That's fantastic. Uh, this is your third year. It seems like your players are better. How happy are you with your staff? It seems like this is the best staff, uh, best staff you've had. Well, you know, comparisons are the kiss of death, so I won't get into comparing our this staff versus last year's staff. Uh, I know this, each and every year, uh, for me, I have the support of our administration that gives me the ability that if and when we lose coaches, which we will, because we've hired really good coaches and uh, since I've been here, that uh, we've got a lot of people that are that want to come and be here at Maryland and help us build this thing. Um, I think the best part about this staff for me is that the, I have some familiarity with these guys, maybe a little different than a couple of the guys that we've hired here in the past, where I've worked with Dan Enos. I've been in the the, the, the wars with him and uh, been able to be in that room and, and help shape and develop these game plans. And we worked really well together uh, the last time uh, we, we were together. Uh, and then with Brian Stewart, the familiarity of him being here the last time we went to back-to-back -back bowl games and the job he's done uh, on defense when he was here. So to me, those are the, that's the comfort level I have because the familiarity, they know who I am. They know how I like to do things. The systems haven't changed. Uh, you know, when you bring in new guys, uh, they can add to it, but the base and the foundation of who we're going to be on offense, defense, and we fence is, is not going to change. And so it's great to, to have some guys come in that I have familiarity with that allows us to kind of keep growing without having to restart, which typically happens when you hire new coaches. You know, it ain't, it's not about locks, man. I, I think they're excited to be a part of coming to a place like Maryland. I mean, everybody knows the, uh, the feeling I have about this place, and that's why I'm here and, and excited to be here. And I want people that want to be here. And as you saw, whether it's players, uh, staff members, if guys aren't bought in to wanting to come here and help Maryland become great, then we move them on and we wish them well and there's no ill feelings. Well, the guys that we brought in here and the reason I was able to hire them so quickly is I think the respect they have for the potential. And that's why I said I'm tired of that word, but everybody knows that this place has a chance to be really special. And for like Brian to come back, he was here the last time and we, we did some decent things. We went back to back bowl games, which Maryland hasn't done in quite some time. So uh, I think people understand that Maryland has an opportunity to be re a really special place. Uh, obviously the new facilities, uh, the type of players we've recruited here, um, it's a destination that I think a lot of coaches would, would have the, uh, would want to be a part of as we move this thing forward. Hey coach, it's great to see you. Um, I remember, uh, I remember in the spring, uh, you mentioned, uh, Terrence Lewis, uh, when he arrived on campus, he had, uh, office and surgery, I guess, just kind of going into camp, I guess, what's his status, what's his availability looking like? Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's not cleared to go yet. Um, you know, he had knee surgery and then he had a follow up shoulder surgery, which all went really well. Our medical staff did a great job of identifying it, you know, and, and it's a byproduct of what COVID does when you don't when you're not allowed to be on campus and you recruit a guy. I mean, here's a guy that played in the state championship game and then he showed up here. 25 days later. So that means he probably played with these injuries. And so for us, we're all about player safety. Uh, we, we did our physical because we were able to get our hands on them and see uh, we got them fixed. Our doctors did a great job of timing it. So now it's just a matter of how quickly he can recover and, and the type of recovery time it takes for him to get back. But, you know, the, the surgeries he ha he's had aren't, you know, major deals. So hopefully we can get him back in time to get something out of him this season. This is a two-parter, uh -oh. but um, first of all, just um, with NIL here, I'm just wondering what your general thoughts are. Um, but second, uh, I don't believe uh, Talia's signed anything, and I know he had mentioned that you know it's something that his parents are kind of helping him with and whatnot. Um, but given you know his massive social media following and you know the fact that he's kind of the face of the program, um, has he talked to you about it? Does it surprise you at all? And you know what what do you kind of think about that as well? 
Well, to answer the, the four-parter, um, first of all, uh, I, I'm all for NIL. It's something that I think I'm on the record of saying that these players should have the ability to take advantage of the name, image, and likeness that they've created for themselves. Uh, and what a better what a better place to do it than right here in a, a major metropolitan area that has two big time markets uh, to be able to utilize it. Um, as far as Ty Lee, I think he's approached it the right way. Uh, he's more concerned about team and, and making sure that he's prepared because they all understand that if you want to grow your brand, then success is what it takes. And as I've told our team, if you make the investment into the team's success, the individual accolades, the individual honors, the individual benefits grow exponentially. And so I, I will also say this, don't believe everything you don't hear because I, I know for a fact that Talia has done some things from a name, image, and likeness standpoint. Uh, they just don't advertise it, and we may not just slip it out during our press conferences like some people do. Hey, Coach Locks, good to see you. What's up, um, Good to see you. Um, you know, looking at the defense, uh, Tarheeb still last year was a standout player as a freshman. Um, what kind of steps are you hoping to see from him this year? And then the defense as a whole, what kind of jump are you hoping to see from them? Yeah, great question. And, and again, Tarheeb was one of those guys that we recruited. And, you know, for as much as we talked about, you know, Rockham, Jared, and some of the other players we've been able to sign, you know, all Tarheeb did was quietly come in here. Um, you know, I don't even know how many stars he's had, but I think he was maybe a three-star guy that came in and started every game as a true freshman. Very, very competitive. Uh, but if you look at his pedigree, here's a guy that was the all-time leading receiver in New Jersey high school football. Um, showed up here and really, really, from the day he stepped on campus, put himself in position to, to, to be able to play and help help this team. Just imagine that he was a true freshman just getting off the yellow school bus last season when we opened up against Northwestern. Imagine what happens now that he's got five games of experience under his belt, just how good an upside he has. So um, he plays in, in a position group that I think, much like how we talked about the receiver group is a very talented group. I thought our DBs did the best job of any position, along with our offensive line, of taking the biggest step last season. Because if you look the season before, we didn't defend the pass very well. We gave up a lot of big plays in the passing game. Um, you know, by the end of the year, we were playing cat coverage. I mean, I got that cat, you got that cat, and running all across the field covering guys. When you pair him with Deontay Banks and Kenny Bennett and, uh, you know, who else we got up there? Deontay, Kenny, oh, J Jacorian Bennett. Uh, all those guys, we got speed, we got length, we got size, and Tarheep fits really well with that group of corners. Uh, hey, Coach, just going back on Terrence Lewis, uh, when did he have the soldier, the shoulder sur surgery? Uh, yeah, I want to say sometime mid-March. Okay. You know, we did the knee first. I want to say the end of January, early February. And once he was off the crutches, obviously we wanted to get him off crutches from the knee to be able to do the shoulder, which then allows him to kind of manage both injuries. But um, he was out. he's out doing running things. You know, we're getting him closer uh, uh, back as quickly as we can. And my second question is, I, w I was curious, what do you preach to your players in terms of how should they handle themselves on and off the field? <laughs> what do I preach to my players with that? Man, I, I, I can write a book. I mean, if you ever raise children, you preach everything. You preach being careful with who you hang around. You preach uh, doing things the right way. You preach that everything you do in the dark usually shows in the light. You preach making the right kind of decisions each and every day. So. As I always do, I equate this coaching business to raising kids. And, you know, I've got a lot of practice. I have four kids myself uh, to be able to use those experience. So um, to me, it's just like raising kids and the same things you want for your children are the same things I want for this team uh, when we go out on the field. Dave Preston, WTOP Radio. Again, no, I didn't introduce myself the last time. So, but uh, offensive line cohesion, looking to build that this summer. Obviously, the the front five more than just Jalen Duncan. What do you like, and what do you expect? And I guess what were the challenges last year in trying to build together a line in a very odd situation? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing with the offensive line, Dave, is that it, it is a process in developing that position group. Meaning, you know. 
we have an old adage in coaching that the further away from the football you play, the quicker impact you can have on the game. Whereas, you know, when you're up front in those trenches on the O-line and D-line, I mean, that's grown man stuff. Like, that's, you know, you can't come in and there's a reason high school players in NFL don't turn pro and go play. You know, imagine a high school guy like they're doing basketball going to the NFL as an offensive lineman. It just doesn't happen. And so for us coming in, uh, building the depth in the O line and bringing in the kind of guys that we we need to be able to run our system. Um, I'm here for three years. It usually takes about three years to develop an offensive lineman. I mean, unless you get one of the ten percenters, meaning a high school guy that has the body ready ready to play, uh, along with the mentality ready to play and the size and strength ready to play, you typically got to grow and develop that position group. And you know that's what for me. The tough part about last season was that we got five games as opposed to the nine that we wanted to play, uh, where those four games could mean the difference in a guy like DJ Glaze and Emilio Moran being able to get extra experience. But uh, we were able to have spring ball this year, um, the, bringing in Brian Braswell and the job he's done with that offensive line group. I think now the next step for them is just developing the mentality because it still starts and ends with how you play up front in the trenches. I like the, the where, where our defensive line is and our offensive line just, we still are probably a couple of players away uh, from a depth standpoint to, to be able to be exactly where we're going to need to be. Coach Loxley, Kevin Richardson with the Baltimore Sun. What's up? What's up? Um, you lost players to the portal, and you've gotten players from the portal. Uh, what's your thoughts on how the portal has changed college sports? Well, I think the biggest thing that I've learned from the transfer portal, and again, much like name, image, and likeness, that's something I'm totally for. Um, again, my philosophy is if you don't want to be here, man, hit the road. Let's go. Uh, it's okay, and we're, we're going to wish you well, and there's no ill feelings, whether it's coaches, players, staff. It's just that's just been my approach. But I think what the transfer portals taught me first and foremost is that the most important recruiting that you do is your team that you have here with you, because everybody always puts emphasis on bringing in players. Well, now with this transfer portal, I think it's really important that we develop the players in our program and we give them the necessary programming to, to help them be the best version of themselves. And if you do that, there's a good chance they'll stay right here and not leave. And I can tell you, I've told this to, you know, Colleen, my, my day-to-day boss and Damon, that uh, the need for player development, meaning the type of staff that helps us manage it, uh, the day-to-day and creating programming that, that allows us to keep guys in the program, uh, it's, it's critical. Because I think, you know, every time you lose a player that's in your program, you know, it takes a while to develop a, a new guy coming in. And so we put the emphasis on let's take care of the kids in our program first and foremost. We're definitely going to always recruit. And, you know, we're a high school-based recruiting uh, operation. I mean, and we're not going to just use the portal. I mean, we're going to use the portal like we use junior colleges, meaning the field need-based only. But I still see us being high school-driven, uh, going out, finding talent in the high school ranks, bringing them in. But we also realize because of this transfer portal and this one-time transfer rule that we better put some emphasis on making sure that the players in our program are happy, like being here, and are having a great time being a Terp. Thank you very much.